I know a lot of you guys out there think it's really hot. But you know, Gabby and I are from the desert of southern Arizona. And this is like a day in February. Thank you, Emily. Esteemed faculty, family, friends, students, and of course, graduates, thanks for the invitation to come and speak to all of you today. It's good to be back here in Cambridge, where gravity is a nice, reliable 1G, where I can breathe oxygen at will, and where it would appear that most of you are not space aliens. But to the rest of you, let me just say, I come in peace. Graduates of the Harvard Law School class of 2015, congratulations on your enormous achievement. It's no secret that you have done a lot to get to this point. You apparently did pretty well on the LSAT and those awful logic games. Some of you in Section 6 made it through orientation with Professor Hansen and his showing of Morgan Spurlock's Supersize Me, which was promptly followed by a cheeseburger buffet. And you finally figured out what Patriot's Day is. And you survived Section Olympics, the Halloween party, and Scorpion Bowls at the Kong. And throughout your time here at Harvard Law School, You've learned to ask the really important questions, to ask why, and to ask how the law can be applied fairly and equally, and to ask how we can advance the proposition of justice. So I know that many of you are probably asking some important questions right this second. Like, who is this ball guy again? And how long do I have to wait to hear from Gabby? Well, I'm here to tell you, don't worry. I'm going to be brief. And then you're going to hear from Gabby. Because I know she's worked really, really hard so that she could have the honor of addressing all of you today. And as you get ready to receive your degree tomorrow, you may be asking some other questions of yourself. Maybe you're asking if it's okay to take a pass on ambition for a while. And maybe you're asking, how do you navigate the push and pull of prestige and meaning, of material success and personal satisfaction? And how do you bear the weighty expectations that come with being a graduate of HLS? Or maybe you're asking yourself, if you're willing to go after something you really want and take the risk of failing. For the next few minutes, Gabby and I want you to forget all about that. For the next few minutes, we want you to think about a few things. We want, to think, we want you to think about determination, courage, and your own path. And we want you to think about service, and we want you to think about second chances. Now, it was really kind for you to invite Gabby and I here today, and let's just say it's very generous of all of you to believe that I might have something useful to say. After all, I almost didn't even get the chance to go to college, let alone law school like this one. And unlike my wife, Gabby, and surely unlike all of you, I was not an academic all-star, and neither was my twin brother, Scott, who also wound up being an astronaut and is currently over 200 miles above us aboard the International Space Station, where he's spending a year, and from where he sends all of you his congratulations. You know, one thing you often hear about astronauts is that they're really smart kind of like Harvard Law School students, that they're whiz kids, that they were chosen for this. Well, my brother Scott and I, we weren't really like that. We were not what you call model students. We weren't even close. And as a result, our dad, who was a stereotypical, tough, New Jersey Irish detective, did not see us go to college. 
and I couldn't really blame him. So he did what he seemed to think was the next best step, and that wasn't college and it wasn't the police force. My dad recommended that we become welders. You know, he often, he even offered to put us in touch with the welders union. Now, why did he do that? I think my dad wanted to make sure that we contemplated a career as a welder, but he also wanted to show us what he thought the future might hold if we didn't get our act together. And he wanted to make sure that we chose our own path and not his. And this is where determination comes in. So I worked really hard during my last years of high school, and I finally made it to college. I went to a place called the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and this is where my own personal determination came in, and I set a really ambitious goal for myself. I decided to become an astronaut, and I planned to be the first person to walk on the planet Mars. Now, I'm sure all of you know this, I never made it to Mars, but I did become an astronaut, and I did make it into space four times. But I didn't get there because I had any sort of aptitude. Just as many of you aren't here on graduation day or the day before getting your degrees just because you're smart, we all got to where we got because we worked our butts off, all of us. And it's because we all had a goal. And tomorrow you're going to reach that goal, so I am very happy to say congratulations. You know, still, I think three years at this law school was not easy. When you got here, you had to either sink or swim in a sea of whiz kids. You know, maybe you got something that wasn't an H. Maybe you got even an LP. <coughs> and I hope that doesn't mean less than passing. You know, maybe, maybe one of your professors told you, hey, this isn't good enough. Maybe you had to deal with some disappointment. And like your work towards achieving this law degree, reaching for your next goal might not go as smoothly as you hope either. Even for all of you, there could be some disappointments and setbacks. And I know how that goes because I kind of got my own LP. After I graduated from college, and joined the Navy and showed up in Pensacola, Florida after flight school, I find out, well, I found out that I was kind of a crappy pilot. And after months of training, I could barely land an airplane on a runway. And you know what the Navy does to you after about a year? They send you to land on an aircraft carrier for the first time. Now, when the Navy sends you to land on a ship for the very first time, there is not anybody that is crazy enough to go with you. So you go alone, all by yourself. And I vividly remember this day, empty back seat of my T2 Buckeye, heading out to the tiny deck of the USS Forrestal. And it looked like the size of a postage stamp. And somehow I survived all this. And later that night, when I was being debriefed by the instructor pilot that had been watching from the back of the ship, you know what the first thing he says to me is? He says, are you sure this career is for you? You're not good at this. And he was right. And my point is that the other student pilots that did well that day did not go on to become test pilots or astronauts. And the student that really struggled that day, me, did. Well, why is that? And I really believe this. It's because how good you are at the beginning of anything you try, it's not a good indicator of how good you can become. Getting an LP is not the end of the world. Neither is failing the bar. You know, FDR failed the bar. And things worked out okay for him. You know, by the way, there's actually like this BuzzFeed list <laughs> that talks about people who failed the bar should take a look at it. And even your commencement speaker tomorrow, your former governor, 
of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, he even failed the bar exam twice. So as you start out in new endeavors, remember that you can start out as a lousy pilot and end up commanding a rocket ship into space. And as you leave Harvard, we promise you another thing. You're going to get a hell of a lot of advice as to what you should do. Some of the people around you, your family, friends, mentors, <coughs> they're going to have some very specific ideas about the path you should take. Right? It's probably already started. Might be like a, a prestigious law firm, a big clerkship, a job at a Fortune 500 company, getting into politics, following in the footsteps of one of your alums, and getting a really miserable job, President of the United States. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that it's okay if you don't take their advice. Sorry, parents. You know, me, my grandma Kelly, she always wanted me to go to law school. She actually always wanted me to go to this law school, just like my cousin Christopher. Even after I joined the Navy, and even after I went to flight school, and even after I flew combat missions over Iraq in Operation Desert Storm, and even after I went to grad school and got a degree in aeronautical engineering and became a test pilot, it was always, Mark, have you given more thought to applying to law school? I think Harvard has a good law school. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, my grandmother, she was proud of me. But even after I joined NASA and I had a chance to fly a rocket ship into space and back, grandma was still really into this law school thing. Now, I know Harvard is not easy, but flying into space isn't a cakewalk either. <laughs> you know, before each of my four space missions, my crew members and I woke up the mor that morning of the launch. We went out to the launch pad knowing that there were really just two possible outcomes for the end of the day. We'd be dead or we'd be floating in space looking down at this amazing planet. And I got to tell you, it's really incredible to see this big blue marble just floating there from the blackness of space. So knowing that, we'd climb into the space shuttle They'd close the hatch, we'd start the countdown, and as the clock got to zero, the computer would light the fuse of this giant frickin' rocket ship. And we were strapped to this thing, and we'd accelerate from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in just eight and a half minutes, until all of a sudden, we'd be in space orbiting the Earth. Then we'd dock with the International Space Station. We'd orbit the planet for a couple weeks. We'd do an incredible amount of work and research. Then we'd undock and we'd fly this thing back towards the planet through the atmosphere at Mach 25. It's 25 times the speed of sound. We'd re-enter the atmosphere from halfway around the world. And we'd fly this thing as a glider without power. And we'd be in this giant fireball. And it would be 5,000 degrees, one foot outside the window so don't think this is hot. <laughs> and we'd have just one chance to land. And eventually we'd land on this runway in Florida, we'd coast to a stop, and we were alive. And each time after I returned from those space missions, I'd go to see my grandma Kelly, she'd give me a hug, she said she's, she was glad that I was safe, and then after not too long, she'd just say, Mark, about law school, I don't think it's too late. <laughs> and she wasn't joking. Look, my grandmother loved me, and she realized that this is an incredible place, and I should have wanted to come here. And she wanted the best for me. But in my case, and I hate to say this, she didn't have it right. I shouldn't have gone to law school. I didn't really want to go to law school, and I probably would not have been a good law student, especially here. And I probably wouldn't have been a good lawyer, and I probably wouldn't have been happy doing it. 
And like Gabby did, I had to choose my own path. And as you leave Harvard Law School, you need to choose your own path as well. But even as graduates of Harvard Law School, you might fail at something along the way. And Gabby and I want you to know this, that it's certainly better to fail at something you really want than to fail at something you really don't care about. I never made it to Mars, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to. But the journey was certainly worth the effort. And we promise you, whatever journey you go on, if it's something you really, really want, even if you don't make it, it's going to be worth it. And as you chase these goals, realize that there might be some tough times. And this is where courage comes in. More than four years ago, on January 8th of 2011, I was at home and Gabby was outside a Safeway supermarket in Tucson doing that most basic thing required in a democracy, and that's listening to the people you represent. It was a quiet Saturday morning, and I was sitting at home talking to my eldest daughter, Claudia, and I got a call on my cell phone from Gabby's chief of staff, Pia, and Pia told me that Gabby had been shot. She didn't have a lot of other information, and about five minutes later, I thought to myself, did I actually really get this call? Maybe I imagined it. So I called Pia back, and that's when she gave me the really horrible news that my wife had been shot in the head and that a bunch of people had died. Now, Gabby and I hope and pray that your lives after Harvard will be free of tragedy. But know this, the road ahead at times will bring you some unpredictable moments. And at times, it will challenge you beyond what you imagined. Now, nothing could have prepared Gabby and me for the challenge that we faced on that day and the challenge that we continue to face. But Gabby's tough, and she has always been an adventurer. And after, Ga after Gabby graduated from Scripps College, she head down, headed down to Chihuahua, Mexico as a Fulbright Scholar where she lived with a Mennonite family with no electricity and no running water. Then it was off to an Ivy League school, Cornell, sorry about that, for a master's degree in regional planning. And then Gabby went on to this fancy job in a skyscraper in Manhattan, and she drove her F-150 pickup truck there. Now, I've been to New York a lot of times. Have you ever seen an F-150 in Manhattan? Seriously, I've never seen one. But later, when her family really needed her, Gabby drove that F-150 back across the country all the way to Tucson, Arizona, because when your family needs you, you show up. She took over running the family's tire and automotive business, and personally and professionally, this was a big risk for Gabby. But Gabby ultimately helped save the business, and then she had an equally adventurous career in politics. And this is where service comes in. She was elected six times to the Arizona legislature, and then three times to Congress. And when she was in office, just like she is now, she was really, really brave. And in moments where the politics in her district became hot and angry, she stood by her principles. And she never backed down from her commitment to women's equality, to finding a smarter energy policy, to protecting our men and women in uniform, or any of those other issues that she really cared about. And when the tough votes came along, like the one on health care reform, Gabby voted her values. And she voted for what she truly believed was in the best interest of her constituents. And she listened to them. And that's why she was at that Safeway parking lot on that Saturday morning, to listen and to serve. Now, many of you have seen dramatic moments from Gabby's life on TV, maybe in the newspaper. But trust me, the more brave moments happened when nobody was there to see them. After she was shot, Gabby had to rebuild. And she had to grieve the lives lost in the shooting 
and she had to come to terms with her own new limitations. She had to learn to walk again, to eat, and do everything with her left hand. And to do all these things that we take for granted, like speaking. Now, you can't imagine the struggle of knowing exactly what you want to say and having the words on the tip of your tongue and not being able to get them out. That's what every day is like for Gabby. And back in the summer of 2011, as Gabby began her recovery, and where I thought I knew what courage and bravery was all about, Gabby took it to another level. It was about seven months after she was injured, she was a full-time patient in a rehab hospital in Houston, Texas, but she was still a member of Congress. And in Washington, there was a pretty big vote coming up, and it was the vote to raise the debt ceiling. It was a vote about whether our government should pay the bills. Now, politically, this was not an easy vote for anybody. And I'm sure a lot of other members of Congress would have loved to have been able to say, hey, I got shot. I'm not coming. But that's not what Gabby did. Gabby decided to be there to have her voice heard one more time. And on the morning, on the morning of the vote, we had to get there fast. So while Gabby was getting ready to leave the hospital, I was at home doing possibly the most dangerous thing I've ever done in my life, and that's to pack for my wife <laughs> for a trip. And after packing her bag, I raced to the airport. I barely made it to the airplane on time. And Gabby and I flew to Washington, went to a hotel, and her young female staff members opened up her suitcase and realized that they need to go to the mall. <laughs> so they went and bought her some clothes. She barely made it to the floor of the House of Representatives on time. Now, I've seen some courageous things in my life. But I've never seen something like Gabby barely out of the hospital going to the floor of the house to do her job. I, you know, I think a New Jersey, I think a New Jersey newspaper summed that day up the best. They said, after months of rancor and pettiness, one small woman brought Washington to its feet. They went on and said, we can compromise on how we fund America. We cannot compromise on how we define America. That definition does not require words. Just look to Gabrielle Giffords. The next year, Gabby decided to step down from Congress to focus full-time on her recovery, and none of this was easy. It wasn't easy for Gabby to resign because, like me, she had chosen to devote her career to public service. And she chose that for the same reason I did, to make her community and this country a better, safer, and more just place to live. Because, as the saying goes, we are all in this together. And the basic idea is that we cannot succeed without the contribution of others. None of us can. That's why you all need to take a chance to serve, to help others succeed. And it's really important for you to do that because all of you are incredibly successful. And as you move on from HLS, there are many ways you can do this. You don't have to be an astronaut or a congresswoman. You can sign a petition, you can write a letter, you can make a donation. You can do more pro bono work. Well, maybe not the guy that did 5,000 hours of it, but the rest of you. The rest of you could do more. You can vote. You can carry a banner in the front, or you can stand near the back. You can yell into a megaphone, or you can listen carefully. You just need to do what you can to make life in your community on, and on this planet a little bit better. And if we know you at all, we know that you're ready because of your experience 
at Harvard Law School. And to those of you who gave so much of your time here at Harvard, the pro bono work you did, and to help those that are less fortunate, Gabby and I want to thank you for that. And we hope you keep it up. After Gabby made the hard decision to resign from Congress and focus on her recovery, I always knew that she would find another way to serve and to help others succeed. And this is where second chances come in. Nearly all the people that experienced the kind of injury that Gabby had on that day, a bullet to the head at point-blank range, die. But Gabby lived, and she grew stronger every day, and she was given another chance at life and another chance at service. And she has seized that chance. She has comforted and held the hands of mothers in Minneapolis who had sought safety in a domestic violence shelter. And she has testified before Congress, this time sitting on the other side of the dais for the first time ever, and faced her former colleagues. And she's spoken out about the bitter partisanship that paralyzes Congress, and she's called for compromises and solutions in the middle. And she continues to be obsessed and I mean this as a compliment, obsessed with encouraging young people to serve. And Gabby's always been the kind of person looking for her own way to serve and who makes things happen. Our friend and my personal hero, a guy named Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13, is that kind of person too. And Jim once told me, that he remembers being amazed when he heard President Kennedy say that we would send a man to the moon. You know the famous speech in 1962, Rice University? He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard, that speech. Well, Jim says that when he heard that, he thought it was impossible. The moon, he said, no way. Then Jim wound up flying to the moon twice. So now Jim has his own saying. He says there are three types of people. He says there are people who make things happen, there are people who watch things happen, and there are people who wonder what happened. <laughs> to be successful, you need to be one of those people that makes things happen. So as you move on from Harvard, Gabby and I encourage you to be the kind of person that makes things happen. And you are all off to a pretty good start because you made this very difficult degree happen. And as a graduate of HLS, we hope you continue this tradition of serving others and to serve your community wherever you can. Let me correct that. We're asking you to. And we're asking you to seize this chance at service because these chances, they don't ever come around very often. Now, I know that someday soon my wife Gabby will be giving these speeches in their entirety. Trust me, if it was up to her, I'd be at home in Arizona cleaning the garage. And she'd be here with you. After all, she got the name Gabby for a reason. Now, you might notice that Gabby's in a wheelchair today, and I want to tell you why. Normally, she would walk right up here to the podium. And this is kind of says a lot about my wife. There's this big race in Tucson called the El Tour de Tucson, a 120-mile bike race. And last year, she rode in a part of it, going about 11 miles. And after the race, she decided next year she's going to do 40, 40 miles. So a month ago, after getting off her bike after a training ride, she fell, broke her leg, which is really a bummer. And she's hobbling a little bit, but she is as optimistic and as positive as ever. And I know she's going to be back on her feet and on her bike soon. But let me tell you this, she's still fighting, even if it's from that chair. 
So now I want to introduce you to the woman who inspires me each and every day and who has taught me to deny the acceptance of failure, who's going to use her voice to honor your hard work and to celebrate you and to challenge you to seize this incredible chance that's before you. Ladies and gentlemen, my wife, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Gabby Gifford, and I used to be in Congress, but don't hold that against me. <laughs> Harvard Law School, thank you for inviting me here today. Graduates, your future shines bright. Find your purpose and go for it. Starting tomorrow, you can help change the world. The nation's counting on you. Be great to lead, to innovate. But today we celebrate you. Be bold, be courageous, be your best. Go crimson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.